Well, brothers and sisters in Christ, grace and peace to you. Got to get organized here. From God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. There are two ways of reading the stories from Numbers today, and both are legitimate, both are true, and both are very different from each other. The first way of reading the story from Numbers is, is reading it as, as God being the angry father. The angry father sitting in the front seat of the car, he's got one hand on the steering wheel, he's got his, his elbow up on the bench seat, and he's turned yelling at three boys in the back seat, none of them wearing seat belts because it's the 70s in my mind, and two of them are crying and one of them is whining and just red-faced, angry, shouting out to his children, I'll give you something to cry about. <laughs> now that's one way to read this text and it's a perfectly legitimate way of reading it because that's what God is doing. He's turning around to the Israelites who have been whining and complaining for 40 years and he's saying, I'll give you something to complain about. And we do see in this text something very true about human nature, about the way that, I guess it's sin, that infects our lives. We, we have such a hard time with perspective. We have a hard time seeing all of the gifts that God gives us. We have a hard time seeing all the blessings. God can heap toys and gifts and money and cash around us until we're wading hip deep, until we're doing the backstroke Scrooge McDuck style in our vault full of money. But if we see somebody else having something that we want, it doesn't matter what we have. And we see this very clearly in our children, but we just become better at masking it as we grow older. We feel the exact same. So we might have everything we could possibly imagine wanting, but if somebody else has a, a speaker that's Bluetooth enabled and iPhone compatible, that's portable, we just think, I want that. And we get frustrated if we don't have it. It's human nature. It's how we are built. Like, so see it with our kids. If you give a child, a seven-year-old, a cookie, he didn't have that cookie before. He didn't do anything to earn that cookie. He gets a free cookie. But if you give his brother or you give his friend a hot fudge sundae, it doesn't matter that he never had a cookie five minutes ago. He sees the hot fudge sundae and he could get so angry, he'll take that cookie and he'll throw it on the ground and he'll stop off to pout because he didn't get the hot fudge sundae. It's human nature, it's part of our broken selves. We don't have that perspective. We can't, we can't see around the present moment and what we don't have. And so we see this with the Israelites. The Israelites are given manna every single day. Manna is perfectly nutritious food. It keeps them alive. They wake up, they leave their tents, and there is manna on the ground. All they have to do is reach down, pick it up, and chew. That's it. In fact, the only rule about manna is you're not supposed to do anything with it. That's it. The only rule is don't take it home and put it away for tomorrow. The only rule is eat it and leave it so that tomorrow you can trust it will be there again. That's it. There's no work to be done at all. And God has faithfully given them this for 35 years, or we don't know exactly how far along they are, but they're towards the end of their journey. For so decades, God has done this. But they wake up and they just can't take it anymore. God, thanks for the free gift of food every morning, but could you put some gravy on top of it? You know what I mean? Could you, could you cover with some frosting? Could we get some spices in it? They, they can't see this free gift. All they can see is what they don't have. We do this as human beings. I remember, again, a story about children, but when I was a child, I would go to my mom. I remember doing this again and again and saying, Mom, I'm thirsty. And my mom would get some water and say, here, have some water. And I'd say, no, I'm thirsty for Kool-Aid. I'm thirsty for 7-Up. I'm thirsty for juice. I don't want that water. And she would say, well, then you must not be that thirsty. And I would get angry. I would get mad at my mom because I want my Kool-Aid. And that's what these Israelites are doing. They're saying, I want my Kool-Aid. They don't have the ability, at least it seems, to, to look beyond that moment and see what God has done, to see that God has given them life. God has, has preserved them for 30 odd years in the desert. To, to see the daily bread, we've already talked about, that just shows up on their doorsteps every single morning. To see that God has given them freedom. To remember back when God delivered them from slavery. They, they can't remember that anymore. And to remember the promise that God has given them that eventually they'll make it to the promised land. That land flowing in milk and honey. The land of Canaan. 
They don't see any of that anymore. They've lost all perspective. All they can see is the present moment. They want a steak. God's given them a sloppy joe. So if we read the text this way, if we get this message from the story, it's pretty clear. What the story is telling us is, unless you are being bitten by poisonous snakes, then all bets are off. But otherwise, give thanks to God. Give thanks to God for he is filling your life with blessings. Now that's one way of reading the story. The second way is very different, but it's also entirely true. This is the worst, darkest moment for the Israelites. Their hidden bottom. This is the, the in their journey, they, this is the, the most tragic, most uh, heartbreaking moment for them. Because they've been traveling again for 30 some years. They have given up all hope of ever seeing the promised land. A lot of them won't make it, even at this point. A lot of them will still die before they get there. So they have sunken into despair. They no longer have the same vibrant faith in their God as they did years before. They've forgotten what God has done for them. So they're kind of limping along, neglecting their, their, their faith life, neglecting their belief. And then in the midst of this already terrible situation where they're exhausted and filled with despair, come these little beasts, this, this enemy, this uh, mindless snake that you can't reason with, you can't defeat, you can't battle it, you can't uh, do anything except just accept that they're there because they're small and they're almost invisible and they just keep biting and killing you. I mean, you, you don't know what's going to happen if you take a walk down to get water. That might be your last walk. You send your children next door to the tent next door. You might not see your child again alive. I mean, it, it's the darkest part of their life together right here in this moment. And they cry out in this half-hearted way to God. They cry out barely believing that God will act, barely believing that God has any power anymore in their world. This, this half-hearted cry out of just numb desperation and God to these people who are completely undeserving God to these people who have earned nothing God gives them a miracle again God gives them life again to a people who have have again turned their backs on God God once more says here just turn and look and live God gives them this incredible gift of, of grace and love. Here, just look at this snake and live. That's all you have to do. Now, dear friends in Christ, again, both of these readings of this story are true and both are our story. We are the ones who need to be reminded of the blessings that God has given us. To give thanks in every circumstance, even when it's difficult. And then we're also the ones that need to hold on to that promise, to be reminded that our God, no matter what, regardless of how, how filled with doubt we may be, regardless of if sometimes the promise feels like it's holding on to smoke, feels elusive and mysterious, still God gives us that, that same promise, no matter what, regardless of if we've earned it or not. That promise, of course, that God so loved the world, he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not die, but have eternal life. Amen.